Thank you to Wu and to Orr and to Noreen and to the Center for Fiction for giving space for this conversation. I'm going to be reading from my essay that's in the anthology. It's called, I Have Seen the One Who Sees Me. The great story goes that they met and fell in love. <coughs> it was ill-fated, ill-advised, a desperate passion. In this story, we will call him Andre, the woman we will call Miss Harrigan, for those were their names in real life. They did what people in love do. They made love. In doing so, they begat Eva. But Andre and Miss Harrigan did not marry. Eva was born a bastard despite being first born. She was treasured by her father, so I am told, despite her parents' lack of official union. But then Andre begat again sons, many sons, this time legitimate. And so Eva and her mother were cast out to the island of St. Thomas, away from the illegitimate, the legitimate children who were settled with Andre and his wife on the island of St. Croix. Andre became wealthy, Miss Harrigan did not. In this narrative, the Arabs are the St. Thomians and the Jews are the Crusians, and maybe the St. Jonians go on to become the Christians, <laughs> though of course, they are all the same people at the root. If you know the Virgin Islands, you will see that this metaphor is no stretch at all. So Eva grew up with her mother and her mother's people. Eva became a wild woman. Perhaps that was the prophecy. Perhaps it is what any firstborn would do when left out of the legacy. Eva knew her father and her father's children knew her, and yet she appears not in one of Andre's family pictures. She is there in the desert, it seems. One of the legitimates tells the tale of Eva visiting them, as Ishmael did. Eva sang at the piano for their entertainment, supper perhaps followed, and Eva was allowed to join them at the table before leaving again for the rocky island. There is a story that goes like that. It is my story. Even in history, there is always a mystery. It is not hard to imagine that Andre is Abraham and Miss Harrigan is Hagar. The magic of the names makes it easy, in which case Eva is, of course, Ishmael. Eva is my mother. So then it is clear where I land in the narrative. I am Nebohath and Kedar and Abdil. I am Mipsam and Mishma and Duma. I am Massa and Taman and Yathur. I am Nefis and Kedema and Mahalaf. Do you remember these names? I am the cast out one. I am the Arabs to the east. Oh, it is true that I grew up Catholic in the Caribbean. And yet, and yet, in this terrible story, I am the people of Palestine, me and all my progeny. The details are different. The details are always different. The narrative may not be all true, nor does it lie. And who, if they place themselves in the story as we all must to make sense of it, wouldn't see clearly what is. Father Abraham, grandfather Andre lived to a great old age, and I was there as we all were, all the brothers, there to bury and honor him. Oh, but did Andre help pay for Eva's college education? He gave parting gifts, yes, but Eva did not inherit from Andre's house, so the covenant insisted, and so it was. In exchange, the children of Miss Harrigan were promised a line of princes. Is that me again? In a surprising twist, I myself teach college now. Professor and Prince share an initial letter. Let me be satisfied with that instead. <laughs> we will multiply and we will be fruitful. But how does the story end? To whom and to where do we belong? We wonder and we wander. We have the patience and endurance of Job. He too was of the disinherited, a man of the East. One of us, remember. Mm.
I frequently quip that Facebook is the new poetry, it makes nothing happen. But the truth is that Facebook is the new affirmer of a trend. We know how to take sides and agree with one side, but not how to consider a question. There was a generation in the 1930s who thought that their choice was between fascism and communism. When Hitler and Stalin go to war, is there really a right side to choose? I find myself falling into this trap every four years. I started going door to door for the Kerry campaign in 2004 because I wanted to meet undecided voters. In my imagination, they were credulous, mouth-breathing morons, destroying the country through their lack of engagement. What I found, in reality, were fascinating people with legitimate questions and reasonable positions with the occasional nut job muttering about the Illuminati. <laughs> but it did return me to sanity in a very real way. In the poem that forms my contribution, as much as I hate to explain my own work, I try to attack the easiness that often informs political decisions, as well as the smugness that comes from being right. My frustration is both with the pieties of the students and with the way the knowledge tends to fail us in the real world. And so this poem is about teaching um, the Merchant of Venice to fifth and sixth graders, <laughs> against my will, <laughs> at summer camp. <laughs> Fine. We can do this. I ask what Shylock is ridiculed for calling out when Jessica elopes and steals her father's money. They don't remember, so I direct them in their scripts. Finally, they find it. My ducats and my daughter. I ask them what Lorenzo has taken, and as the light dawns, one girl answers, his ducats and his daughter. I say, so the Christians want what they ridicule Shylock for wanting. And slowly, they see the light. Fifth graders of the world, unite! <laughs> this is their first experience of what we used to call reading against the grain. They have never read against the grain. They have never felt so smart. They have never realized that a text can contain its own critique. Fifth graders of the world, do not spend your summer at school camp. The most childlike of my children looks like a porcelain doll and cries at the drop of a hat. He cries because the other children are mean to him, and the children are mean to him because he treats them with disdain and is always about to cry. As I comfort him for the third time that day, I realize how much less real he is to me than Antonio. At the end of six weeks, I will deliver this boy back to the incompetent arms of his socially awkward parents and never consider him again. <laughs> uh, and this is a little later in the lesson. My assistant tries once more to interest our children in Antonio, to start the conversation that might lead to Elizabethan perceptions of sodomitical subcultures that they existed in early modern Venice, but without luck. We wonder if our students notice how queer we are. And that night, we joke about creating a 1990s version of Merchant of Venice that could open with Antonio breaking the silence and conclude with an act-up demonstration in which a genderqueer Portia would insist on her right to body modification surgeries and a Derridian Jessica would deconstruct the Jewish-Christian binary. In addition to dredging up recovered memories of satanic abuse at the hands of Shylock. We make ourselves laugh, smug, in our knowledge, but sad in its failure. Though even that doesn't quite resolve the question of why Antonio is sad. Um, I too echo what my colleague said. Thank you, Ru, for creating this project. And thanks to all books for the courage. Um, when Ru asked me to submit, I I had just finished reading a wonderful novel and had decided to translate it. So these are not my words, but the words of a Palestinian novelist who lives in New York. Uh, the novel is entitled The Book of Disappearance. I'll read a very, and she's in the audience, if you want to say hello to her later. <laughs> I'll read my, uh, the short introduction as to why I chose this text and then excerpts from, from the novel. Uh, very few works can, can capture the magnitude of a catastrophe and of its effects and afterlives. The Book of Disappearance confronts the memory of loss and the loss of memory. It goes to and comes from 
the heart of Palestine, a site of ongoing violent material and discursive erasure. In her novel, the ghosts of history and of its victims still roam the streets of Palestine, even though the names have been changed, and haunt the colonizers and their descendants. They restate the questions once again and demand justice and recognition. Literature achieves one of its most powerful effects, preserving memory and defending life with beauty. The premise of the novel is that the Israelis wake up one day to see that all of the Palestinians have disappeared, which, is, which has been the wish of many Israeli uh, politicians, <laughs> on the record, actually. And then so it follows what happens in Palestine and Israel when the Palestinians disappear. But it's narrated by two um, characters, an Israeli uh, and a Palestinian. The section that I will read is from, from the notebook left by the Palestinian and that is being read by his Israeli neighbor, in which the Palestinian is, has many conversations in the novel with his deceased um, grandmother about Jaffa and its history and other stuff. So, the book of disappearance. I am mad at you. Your memory, which is engraved in my mind, has all these holes in it. Your Jaffa resembles mine, but it is not the same. Two cities impersonating each other. You carved your names in my city, and so I feel like I am a returnee from history. Always tired, roaming my own life like a ghost. Yes, I am a ghost who lives in your city. You too are a ghost living in my city, and we call both cities Jaffa. You used to say that you would walk in the morning but could not recognize the city, nor could you recognize the streets, as if they too were displaced with those who were forced to leave. My child eyes back then tried to imagine the scene the way you described it, as if the darkness swallowed them, as if the sea took them hostage. This is how you described your days and those who were forced to leave and go beyond the sea. But you didn't say that the population of the city went from 100,000 to 4,000. No, you didn't say that. But you said that you couldn't recognize your city after they had left. What sense of bereavement? I cannot comprehend these figures. Nor can I understand what it means for a city to be emptied like that. I, who was born and raised in Jaffa, after Jaffa had left itself. You said you used to walk down the streets laughing out loud with your father. Barbed wire surrounding, surrounding you for more than 10 years. No one could leave Ajami except with an official permit. They even stole Jaffa's name when they placed it under Tel Aviv's administrative custody. Is this why I dislike Tel Aviv? Did I inherit this slump in my throat from you? Why do I still live in it then? Why shouldn't you? This is Palestine. These are Jaffa's villages and it will always be ours, you said to me. But then you felt silent, as if speech was painful. You said you went out with your father in what can only be described as a fit of madness. You walked with him and greeted strangers to fool him into believing that what he himself had said was true, that everyone had returned to Jaffa. You said he was demented and saw everyone there. Ten years passed and he couldn't get used to his new Jaffa. Can one get used to his Nakba? They changed street names into numbers to remind you that you were in a prison called Jaffa, as if you needed anyone to remind you of that. You said that your father saw bus number six coming on time and saw his partner, Zico, giving him back the keys to the Mobilia warehouse they co-owned. You always said Mobilia instead of furniture because you loved the sound of it. Had I not seen this Zico in a photograph of my grandfather, I would have thought that he was a figment of your imagination. Zico. What kind of name is that anyway? Was that his nickname, I asked you? You said you didn't know. He was your father's partner and owned furniture stores in Jaffa. They looted the country and the people, so you think they wouldn't loot furniture? Of course. And how many times have I said, I don't want to talk about this? 
My father became demented and died of his heartache after that year. Why do you keep asking? How many times do I have to give the same answers? Please, sweetheart, for God's sake. And then you went back to your silence. You realized that your father was demented when he knocked on your door one cold morning. He said that Zico had visited him during the night and said they could go back to bring the furniture from the warehouse and open the stores. You didn't say anything when you heard him say that. You stopped arguing with him when he yelled and said that he wanted to go back to his home. When you told him he was at home, he accused you of lying. At first, you didn't understand what was taking place. Then you realized that he was demented all of a sudden. And you realized that he was going to die all at once as well. You took him by the hand and walked with him on his last morning. I walked and felt I was going to the gallows. The Israelis could have killed us. We weren't allowed to just go out whenever we pleased. There was barbed wire everywhere. We were in prison, and he was determined to leave Ajami. God saved us. I don't know how. I was reciting the Kursi chapter from the Quran all the way. I was terrified. You took a deep breath after the last sentence as if all the air in the world wasn't enough to fill your lungs. Sixty years later, and you would still feel a tightness of breath when you talked about the Nakba, your Nakba, and Jaffa's, your Palestine. You took him by the hand and greeted the strangers as if they were the city's people. You said that God must have heard your prayers because no one stopped you to ask for permits. Pedestrians nodded as they responded to your greetings in a language they did not know, as if everyone had agreed to let him bid his hometown farewell. When you returned home, he said he was going to bathe and sleep a little. But you knew that this was it. Did he take a bath because he knew he was about to die? Did you do the same? Is that why you took a bath before leaving and refused to let anyone come with you? You hadn't left the house for six months. Did you want to die alone by the sea? Survivors are lonely. Good evening. Really, uh, it's an honor to have been invited to be in this anthology and to be at this event and to be a participant in this conversation. That's really important. Uh, I'm going to try to be very, very brief and read just two very short poems. Um, but to sort of give a frame, I would, thought I would read the uh, statement that I wrote in the anthology. I feel the fault line that runs through Palestine to Ferguson. It's one that's been running beneath us a long time, through several borders across many ages, linking one injustice to another one set of historical violences to its cousins. Though it's important to note that to link injustices isn't necessarily, importantly, to conflate or equate them. I can recognize, for instance, the logic that leads to a Palestinian child being killed unsentimentally by a drone attack, a lynching, as linked to the logic that would also have a policeman's bullet enter a black American child's head, a lynching without ever once having to claim that the cries both children made, that their mothers made, were the same. They are not the same. They carry different weights, different colors, but have some kinship, I think. When I say logic, I guess I mean all the discourses that would have these events make sense, even as we know they are senseless, and therefore continue to propel these events outside the arena of the imagination and into bald reality. The imagination, that's what I'm always thinking about. How it is that thing both uniquely, paradoxically, maybe simultaneously, responsible for the ways we can bring harm to each other and all the other ways we can love and heal. So this poem um, is called Southern Gothic. About the dead having available to them all breeds of knowledge some pure, others wicked, especially with his future, and the history that remains once the waters recede, revealing the land that couldn't reject or contain it, and the land that is not new, 
is indigo, is ancient. Lived as all the trees that fit and clothe it are lived. Simple pine, oak, grand magnolia. He said they frighten him, that what they hold in their silences, silences. Sometimes a boy will swing from his climbing, drown, but the myth knows why. Sometimes a boy will swing with the leaves. And my last poem is the poem that appears in the anthology. Um, it is an excerpt from a long poem that took me about two years to write um, that variously meditates on the ghosts of history, particularly Southern American history. Um, but it also is in conversation, hard conversation, with Wallace Stevens, and particularly his poem, Like Decorations in a Nigger Cemetery. And it also outright steals its form. So his form is 50 short lyric sections of no more than six lines. And I decided to do the same thing. Um, but also in my poem, um, different from his, um, there are other forms that sort of haunt and are mixed up inside of the 50. So there's a pantoum that's broken up, and there's a sistina. So this, is, this excerpt is the sistina that's broken up throughout the poem. And it's called Of the Leaves of the Fallen, Stevens, Like Decorations in a Negro Cemetery. One, in the imagination there is no daylight, and like Wallace Stevens, I know the dark is crucial. I sing, I grieve in it, I dream what haunts each night. These bodies, even lynched, still are thinking. Nothing is final, I'm told. No man shall see the end but them, my fathers, lifted into fire like tongues. Seven. Sometimes they skinned the faces so the tongues when they fell, fell. Sometimes they yanked and hacked away, detaching limb from limb, upending. Not death. Sometimes it was the dying that was crucial. Seven hours once for the torture. I read this thinking about that body slow, unblooding human with a knife. Fourteen. This was the American South, American Night, the Medusa, the live head with the many tongues, the live tongue with the many minds and the thinking that through a kind of swank violence and through a kind of steel, a beauty, a pure and crucial history could be found, be restored, and made endless. 21. When did you decide to trust your endurance, to turn back on this world dressed in a spectral night? You know it by the ash, the wake of the crosses, how shut up boy burns beneath every tongue. I wonder whose eye can resist looking back and not swallow them. These men, muted, gray, thinking. 28. What will the mind do for thinking when a body stalls, slows, diminuendos, but continue? The thinking gone on and like grief, grown as pregnant as the night. Imagine, his body like a pendulum, a tongue, a fever that won't break, gorgeous, that furious core. 35. History, here's my muscle, my skin, my crucial blood, my heart, my stubbornness, my thinking, my hauntedness, my ghosts, my American tongue. I give it up. I give it all away. Here's my ending, my making, a tableau of me traced against the night. Take my unworthiness, my privilege. Take my hand. You know, one great thing about coming last is that uh, I get to hear everybody read. And, uh, you know, one of the strange things about topics like this is that uh, after a while, you hear so many different viewpoints that you feel like you kind of live in a hell of opinions. And uh, one of the most relieving things about this evening is that uh, there were very few opinions and there was a lot of experience. So I, I really thought that was a wonderful aspect of it. I'm just going to read an excerpt from uh, this essay and um, it was basically came out of some journalism I've been doing over the last uh, eight years uh, in the Middle East and uh, East Africa. And this particular uh, piece focuses on uh, a visit to uh, Palestinian refugee camp and also uh, a place called uh, what it will say. It's called The Extravagance of Grief. In thinking over what I learned about the lives of the Palestinians I talked to during a trip I took to Lebanon and Syria, I want to focus on feeling. Not my feelings, 
but on the feelings of the people I talk to. The dominant emotions, as the refugees talk about how they've been forced out of their homes during the 1948 Nakba, which in English means something like catastrophe, were grief and grievance. In one case, an old man told the story of watching how, as a small boy, Israeli soldiers murdered his mother, father, and brothers. The old man, tightly controlled, told the story with a muted intensity. He looked calm at first, but under that was grief and anger. And not an unreflective anger, but articulate, historical, as well as personal. And yet, as I listened, I confess that it was easier to take in his grief than his grievance. But the more I listened, the more I became convinced that grief and grievance cannot be separated. And though one of the reasons why there is no real peace process and why so-called policymakers keep making the situation ever more desperate is their absolute insistence on keeping grief and grievance separate from one another, as if the emotional immediacy of grief would verify the justice of the grievance, or the grievance would be weakened by having to feel the other person's grief. In a sense, what I'm talking about is the difference in feeling between a political conviction and what you might call a political emotion. Political emotions are contradictory. They require a fresh response to every new provocation. <coughs> nor do they easily resolve into settled opinions or fit neatly inside some prefab ideology. They partake of political convictions, but only as that conviction is put to the test in our daily lives. They keep faith with the difference between what we think we ought to feel and what we really do feel. But to make grief and grievance more complex terms, Robert Frost puts grief, grievance, politics, and poetry in relation. Quote, politics is an extravagance, an extravagance about grievances, and poetry is an extravagance about grief. You can sense in Frost the kind of skepticism about grievance as if grievance as a source for poetry were too partial of an emotion, too self-limiting, in fact, too self-interested to reliably express the full range of a person's experience. And while there may be something to frost suspicion, and the hard conditions in the Palestinian camps that I visited, Sabra, Shatila, and Harak Reich, there's something a little luxurious about being able to decouple politics and grievance from poetry and grief. And so I want to give you an example of how politics and grievance and poetry and grief are all on a seamless continuum. One of the places I visited during my 2000 set trip was the Golan Heights. I spent part of the day in a ruined Syrian town, Kanaitra, absolutely destroyed in the 1973 Yom Kippur War between the Syrians and Israelis. Before the Israeli army withdrew after the 1973 ceasefire, the Israelis evacuated the 37,000 Arabs living there and dismantled the town, stripping buildings of windows, doors, anything that could be carted off. These were sold to Israeli contractors, and then bulldozers and tractors moved in and knocked down most of the strip buildings, now mangled slabs of concrete and rebar. All that was left of the human presence in the village were herds of cows pasturing on what was once somebody's yard or garden. There was bird song everywhere, made all the louder by the absence of any human voice or the rattle or clank or roar of a machine. A garden full of roses run wild might once have been a passionate gardener's delight and pride. As a ruin, it was almost picturesque. As a place of suffering, it held an air of melancholy and menace. 
The village was kept as a shrine memorial by the Syrian government, which of course used it for propaganda purposes as well. The hospital, which is only an empty shell of long cinder block corridors, was popped all over by what looked like 20 millimeter shell holes. At the axis of the hospital, you could look down the hallways at the empty concrete window frames and see the green countryside stretching away to neat lines of olive trees planted on the slopes of the Golan Heights. Swallows swooped in and out of the building, and the floor in some of the rooms was deep in powdered concrete. The impression this made of ghost town ruins, scenically pastoral, but a monument to still current suffering, put politics, grief, and grievance into such complex relation that what I've called political emotions would have been slighted if you'd settled for the Syrian or Israeli government's official version of what happened. The ruins themselves couldn't be turned into mere fodder for self-justifying rhetoric. And the way that Kanaitra became a subtly different emblem from what the Syrian or Israeli governments intended it to be was made even clearer by a visit we then made to a Palestinian refugee camp in the Golan Heights. We went into a carpenter shop where people began together, and soon we were conversing with a man in his 60s who took us into his home, served us coffee and soft drinks that looked like wine. As he talked about his past, at one point he asked if we'd like to see the deed to his family's holdings in Golan. And when he said that the deed was covered in the blood of his brother, whom the Israeli soldiers had killed back in 1948, I thought he was making a metaphor, since he just said that living as a refugee in a tent when he was a child was like living in a spider web in the heart of a well, and that the life of an exile was a life in desert places that resembled the life of a slave. So when he said that watching his mother being killed, his four brothers being killed by the attacking Israelis was like a lake of blood and that the deed was stained with blood, I assumed his reference to the deed was a metaphor, almost Shakespearean. But then he asked us again if we'd like to see the deed, and he called his nephew on his cell phone, and the nephew came with the deeds to his family's property. And yes, the deed was literally stained with blood, three long brown faded stains that had bled across the legal east. So I'll finish with a poem, very short. And I guess I'll follow on from Sanan. And it's a translation. It's a poem that was written in 2000 BC from a Sumerian spell. It's called Lamentation on Ur. And it's about the destruction of Ur. Like molten bronze and iron, shed blood pools. Our country's dead melt into the earth as grease melts in the sun. Men whose helmets now lie scattered, men annihilated by the double-bladed axe. Heavy beyond help, they lie still as a gazelle exhausted in a trap, muzzle and the dust. In home after home, empty doorways frame the absence of mothers and fathers who vanished in the flames, remorselessly spreading, claiming even frightened children who lay quiet in their mother's arms, now born into oblivion, like swimmers swept out to sea by the surging current. May the great barred gate of blackest night again swing shut on silent hinges destroyed in its turn may this disaster too be torn out of mind